truth is you need to be asking Rory about that because that was his terms. He came up with them and it's really good. Um, he goes more in depth than I do. But basically what you have is the three stages where the operative conditioning is what you need to know, what you need to have ingrained and learned and so you can do in the safety of the training and understand and you can make sure you can apply it in the fighting. But that's a key element there that you have to have about like the dynamics and the build up and all this other stuff about what leads to violence, how to avoid it. Moving on to the next part, you have the freeze, which is something that as much as we're ashamed of it, we all freeze. Everybody freezes, doesn't matter who you are. The freeze is your body's, uh, 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 what do I do? And you also, and it is both your body and your mind, and it's learning how to get past that, learning how to move beyond that. And then there is the physical application of the fight. So all of these elements need to be there, and yet a lot of times people go, oh, well, we're only going to focus on this without realizing what's missing. Now, Rory wrote a book that addresses the missing parts of what has to be in self-defense training. And Rory also wrote uh, Meditations on Violence, which is a great book, and I highly recommend people read it because it'll give you a different perspective on violence than most people will have. There's all these different elements of training, and there's no one training method that does everything. So that's a big problem because there are some amazingly good training elements here, 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 here. Um, but when you take this one element that's so good here and then try and claim it does everything, you're going to run into problems. Uh, for example, boxing. Boxing is great. Punching with the boxing, they are the best punchers. Muay Thai fighters, best kickers I know. Um, the thing is, it's not just one thing. So yes, you study boxing, you get that aspect. You, you study kicking and Muay Thai, you get that. There's issues about adrenaline, there's about the dynamics of violence, it's understanding, and it's all these little different things that you have to collect. And it's almost like there's tools, each tool is different, and you need to have all of these tools in your tool box, rather than finding one tool that does everything. Before we get into tactics, there's a really old saying that I like, and that is, a bully doesn't want to fight you. He doesn't want to fight at all. He wants to beat, beat you up and be done with it. So realize that coming into the situation, there's differences already. That somebody who's fighting, you're in a conflict. You're in a situation that you're trying to solve something between the two of you. Um, a bully doesn't want to fight. He doesn't want to solve the issue. He just wants to thump on you. Uh, realize though that a lot of bullies who want to assault you and overwhelm you really aren't interested in fighting. So if you're willing to meet them on that level, they will often back away from physical violence. So that's a start right there. Claiming that you teach self-defense without involving use of force knowledge and about the, and the realities of the law is like training somebody to drive but not telling them about braking um, or the traffic laws or what speed limits mean or what side of the road to drive on. It's actually you're setting the person up for a disaster. One of the issues that has been a long-standing problem with me is people come up to go, well, you know, if this ever happens. No, I don't train for if this happens. I train people for when it happens. When you're dealing with what, what really happens with violence, you have to deal with the aftermath of violence because that's part of it. And what the importance of knowing the aftermath you also realize that the precursor of violence is equally important because you will be judged by what you did before. That's going to affect the aftermath. So one of the key elements, for example, is self-defense 
is you don't have a choice. You are just really not in any way, shape, or form able to keep this from happening. A fight, however, you have a participation in. You have a buildup, you are an active participant in, and what you say and do is beforehand is going to determine whether the police are going to look at it as fight or self-defense. Because if they find what you're doing was a fight, you will be judged, you will be arrested because fighting is illegal. The first thing that you have to understand is an overwhelming majority of violence is social violence. And yet there are people who are making lots of money claiming, oh no, we're going to teach you how to handle a social violence because it's lethal and we only teach you how to do the lethal stuff. Yeah, that's a good way to end up in prison. Um, knowing the differences of violence and the purposes of social and asocial violence is critical because if you can't tell the difference, you can't articulate the difference, you're going to have a really hard time explaining why you did that. And also, more than that, you're more likely to react wrong. You're going to overreact to a situation that you're going to go, oh, oh, it's lethal. No, it wasn't. So, you know, I often tell people that you only have two problems with your system. One is if it doesn't work, and the other is if it does work. So, knowing the difference, being able to tell what sort of situation you're in, be able to explain what that is, and navigate this, both can be de-escalated and they're done differently, but if you're in a situation where you need to use lethal force, for example, you should be able to articulate why that was the case. More than that, if you're in a situation where you don't need to, that knowledge will keep you from making the mistake of using lethal force when you shouldn't. I often say that there's two circles when it comes to this subject. And you need to realize that each circle is totally different than the other. There is the circle of application. There are that which you need to know and have under your belt so you can use it with physical violence when it comes to this, this kind of training. The thing is, that's a very small circle. Most people get involved in the training and what they're involved in this other circle, the bigger circle, and that's all about these monkey brain issues, pride, the camaraderie, the social networking, the really self-medication of a lot of people who are like, I was bullied as a child so I'm going to actually get this killer kung fu training so I can be a man. Um, and the fact is, it's all about all this other social stuff and this other you know, I, so I can feel good about myself stuff and has absolutely nothing to do with what you really need to do and understand for application. But the marketing of this is you can't say, yes, we're here to do a self-help and you know, you give us lots of money so we make you feel good about yourself. No, they claim it's gotta be about application. They claim it's the killer ultimate reality-based whatever, you know, combative system. Um, the thing is, they spend more time over here in this circle and claim that they're doing this. And it's a really big problem because, again, the people here say, well, if I ever had to use this I'd, that's not preparing you for actually having to use it. The realities that you need to know in order to be able to use this stuff are very specific and it has less to do with marketing and a lot to do with what you know. And yet, the marketing is where the money is. The, the selling the macho fantasy is where the money is. <laughs>